especially happy to be here today because I want to talk about the intersection of privacy and data, and particularly big data. Data and big data is beguiling. I have spent a substantial part of my career at a statistical agency, and I am deeply steeped in the notion that data is good and that the appropriate use of high-quality data represents our society's best chance to improve education and so many other fields in this country. But the point that I want you to take away today is that the work that you are doing, work involving big data, does have privacy implications and that if you do not pay attention at the outset on your projects that you may run into roadblocks that will uh, derail your work. Data use and data use for big data in particular is highly controversial. I want you to come away from this with an understanding of some of the trigger points and with the framework for being able to uh, think through these issues. So I have 45 minutes here today. I have cut my speech so that I am allowing a lot of time for questions. Um, I want you to put on your thinking hats, and uh, I hope that you have some questions for me at the end. And if not, hey, Gordon has some more time to speak. So um, I'll run through a very short history of information privacy in this country. Uh, I'll, I'll cut a lot of my history speech in here. Uh, I'll talk about privacy specifically in the education context. I'll talk about FERPA, the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, and about fair information practice principles. I'll talk about the new uh, White House reports on big data that were released on May 1st. And I'll talk briefly about some selected current issues about privacy in the education context. Um, smart data, discrimination, database multiplication, re-identification, and open data. So with that, what is privacy? Um, people talk about privacy and they mean many different things. To many people, privacy means civil liberties. Uh, it means the issues raised by the Snowden disclosures. It means the use of um, cameras on every street corner in major cities, particularly in Europe. It means those of us who flew here and went through total body scanners. When the Supreme Court talks about privacy, it's usually referring to intimate relationships. It's referring to abortion or homosexuality or birth control. In information privacy, sometimes it's thought of as the right to be left alone, and sometimes it's thought of as the right to control information about you. In this country, we have a fairly extensive federal legislative um, framework for privacy, and this looks at privacy primarily in terms of the right to control information about you. I want you to understand, though, that not everyone is a privacy advocate. There are those who contend that uh, privacy laws have a cost associated with them, and that cost is restricting the free flow of information. Think about the importance of the free flow of information for political freedoms. There's an article in the um, paper this morning, I was reading about new restrictions on the internet and the use of the internet in a variety of foreign countries, uh, Russia, China, Turkey, et cetera. Think about the uh, Arab Spring um, organizing that was all done on the internet based on the ability to immediately and anonymously interact. Think about the importance of the free flow of information for commerce. That is not our 21st century economy premised on the free flow of information. It allows for comparison shopping, for price efficiencies, et cetera. And think about innovation, which I think is probably key in the, the minds for many of you, and what effects our privacy laws have on innovation. At its core, privacy is a debate about the role of an individual in society and in community. It's about individual autonomy and community. It's about not just the real harm that can come to people when privacy is violated, but it's also about gut reaction, and to some degree it is increasingly about emotional reaction. I'll talk a little bit more about that. One of the fascinating things to me about privacy is that in this country it is not a red-blue matter. We are a highly divided nation in uh, red, blue, red and blue states. I have the misfortune of living in a purple state, which means we get all of that advertising. Um, but this is not a Republican or a Democratic issue. I was at a meeting recently where Senator Markey spoke from um, Massachusetts, and he said, uh, privacy is where the far left meets the far right to box out the moderate middle. I liked that statement there. Um, in every Congress, we have new privacy laws proposed and amendments to our existing privacy statutes. Most of these die on the vine. Privacy is a controversial topic, and there are few political wins that can be scored with privacy legislation. So let me start with my history lesson. I've cut this way back. I'm a total history geek, and I don't want to uh, take you guys out with this here, but I think it is helpful context. 
So in ancient times, uh, privacy wasn't a concept that made any sense. People lived in villages, they lived in small towns, they knew each other, and they knew each other's business. Um, but when we started having cities and travel, people started interacting with strangers, and we came up with the concept of us versus them. Technology is also a huge game changer in the uh, history of privacy. Before data was widely available on the web, there were practical limitations on what we could know about each other. My favorite example, um, how much my husband and I paid for the house that we live in has always been a matter of public record. You can go to the deed records and look up what anybody paid, essentially, for their house. But it really wasn't until information was freely available on the web that any one of you sitting here today could go look up and find out how much your house is worth. Um, not only is that information publicly available, it's also aggregated with other information about me. In 1890, Louis Brandeis, who was to become a very influential Supreme Court justice, published a law review article that he co-authored with another attorney, where he, for the first time, suggested that we create a um, judicial right, a right to privacy in this country. It's a rare example, as a lawyer I'll say this, a rare example of a lawyer that looked at the big picture and drew conclusions about the future of his society. And it's probably the most influential law review article ever written. He states at the outset that societal developments are what caused he and his co-author to argue in favor of a right to privacy. And he concluded that recent innovations and business methods were adversely impacting people's right to be left alone. I find very amusing in this day and age the technology and the technological development that caused Louis Brandeis such concern. It was um, pictures, photographs. People were taking photographs of other people and they were being published in the newspaper. And this was very upsetting to Louis Brandeis. It used to be that societies, that nations didn't have a strong need to be able to distinguish and identify individuals. Even last names are a relatively new phenomenon in uh, the history. Um, and now it is computers that has in fact made personal identification possible in the modern world. Um, fingerprints and before that measurements, um, anthropological Signalment was a, a system of measurement that was used back in the 19th century to measure, us very measure various body parts to be able to re-identify individuals. After that, of course, came fingerprints. But it wasn't until this information was available on computers that anyone could look through it to be able to realistically re-identify people out of large numbers. Now, of course, we have fingerprint databases. As I like to say, the National Fingerprint Database in this country includes criminals and federal employees. <laughs> Um, and we have uh, DNA databases as well. All servicemen and service women in this country in particular are uh, in a federal DNA database. School districts are increase, not increasingly, sometimes use fingerprint scanners and palm scanners for things like getting children through the lunch line. Schools contend that this uh, makes the lines move much more efficiently and it does not have any chance of identifying the students who are receiving free and reduced price lunch. But yet, I presume some of you, like I do, have an emotional reaction to that. Does that feel right to you? Now we're working with identification, of course, based on other biometrics. You've probably heard a lot about this over the last uh, several days, and I don't need to go into this in great detail. We have retinal scans. We have iris scans, which are more accurate over a lifetime. And of course, facial recognition software. Uh, facial recognition software most famously was used recently to help find the uh, Boston Marathon bombers. We also have performance data, how well somebody performed a task, um, particularly on a computer. Uh, technology that allows people to be identified on any computer anywhere in the world based on what they're doing on the computer and how they are doing it. So all of these technologies identify bodies, and they identify them with fairly accurate precision. What we don't have so much is the ability to put that with a name attached. Um, what, we, what do we use in the US for identification? We do not have a central registry of births and deaths in this country, and we don't have a registry of citizens. Interestingly, we had a proposal in the mid-1960s for a national database. And this proposal went down in flames once uh, newspaper articles and congressional hearings started being held on the topic. The proposal was generated by a desire for greater efficiency, to have more accurate databases and produce better data. But now, in practice, we use social security number for individual identification. Social security number, of course, was never intended to be used for this purpose. 
when the Social Security Act was passed in 1935, we needed a system to be able to identify consistently and reliable every individual from your first paycheck you receive until the death of your last um, beneficiary. Against all of the intent to the contrary, we now use Social Security number quite widely in this country. National identity card proposals continue to be raised. They were raised a lot after September 11th, and all of them have died on the vine. And in the last several years, we continue to see them. Both parties, congressmen and senators, have introduced bills, particularly immigration bills, that contain a proposal for national identity card. Again, these proposals are controversial, and they are um, eliminated as the bills move forward. So the National Data Bank proposal that I told you about in the mid-1960s, that plus the growth of credit and the credit industry in this country led to the first passage of our privacy laws and to the growth of the um, fair information practice principles. Because we had credit and credit reporting agencies, which of course they're private companies, they receive data from the lenders about uh, how well people pay back their loans. And there's errors in credit reporting agencies and credit reports. And these led to real and substantial harms. People who were not able to buy houses, people who were not able to uh, make purchases, other types of purchases. So the first of the major privacy statute was the statutes in 1970 was the Fair Credit Reporting Act. It's still in existence and this is what lets you go check your credit report um, and uh, eliminate the errors from it. This was followed by the establishment um, of a commission, a uh, privacy commission held, headed by Elliot Richardson, the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. The goal was to study the impact of computers on privacy, and the end result of this were the fair information practice principles. Uh, you see them now in any number of forms and any number of numbers of them, um, but the original principles, there were five of them. I'll run over them real briefly. The first is notice and awareness that consumers should be given notice about a data collection about them, what it's going to be used for, how it will be protected, how long it will be kept. The second is choice and consent. This is giving consumers the option to control how their data is used, whether it's opt-in or opt-out. It's having some variety of consent, saying, yes, I want my data collected and used for this purpose. The next is access and participation, the right to verify and contest the accuracy of information that's wrong. If de benefit determinations are being made about you on information in a database, you should have a right to be able to correct what is wrong. Next, integrity and security, probably one of the um, less controversial of the fair information practices. If you're collecting information about people, you need to keep it secure and you need to do your best to make sure it is accurate. And the last is enforcement and redress. There should be some avenue where people can correct data about themselves. These five principles are still huge. They are the basis of all major privacy legislation at the federal level in the United States, and they are the basis of the European privacy framework. Um, we now have a veritable alphabet soup of uh, privacy statutes in this country. FERPA is but one of those. The impetus um, for privacy legislation in this country, however, has moved from the federal level, from the federal Congress, and it has moved to the state level. Uh, we now have, um, I think the current st statistic is that we now have 92 bills pending in 34 states that attempt to um, add new student privacy statutes. Many of you in your states have um, considered and some states have adopted some of these statutes. These bills generally um, deal with the K-12 environment only. They don't deal with higher ed data. They all vary a lot, but in general it's K-12, and they do different things. Some of them bar school districts from sharing data with the state. Some of them bar the use of data for specific activities. Some of them bar the, the collection of specific types of data. It's very common for these bills to bar the collection of biometric data, for example. Some mandate specific types of data security. The ones that are uh, more poorly drafted mandate um, encryption for data at rest, data in motion for all varieties of data, whether sensitive or non-sensitive, for example. Some of these bills bar the use of cloud computing. Some bar the movement of data out of state, and some of them require the appointment of a chief privacy officer for the State Education Association.
Some of these bills are really good. I like provisions of some of them. Some of them are highly um, problematic. They're a reflection of the degree of emotion and concern that exists about privacy in the education context right now. They have the potential to affect your work. The truth is that it's really hard to have a discussion about privacy in the education context and to have that discussion be fact-based. Uh, many of you all have read recently about the demise of In Bloom um, and have read some of the media articles that read, led up to that. It's very difficult to get out accurate information about student privacy and about the use of data in education. The conversation on this subject is often flat out wrong and it tends to be emotion driven rather than fact driven. And now of course we live in the world of the Internet of Things. We have sensors in all of our objects, we have Google Glass, and uh, we have third party agencies that have data about you. We're not talking just about government um, databases that have information about people. We have data brokers. So did you all know that you all are scored by these data broker companies not just on your credit score, not just on your propensity to pay back a loan? Each of us has a score on a number of other factors that are unique to these uh, data broker companies. It is how influential you are with other people's buying decisions, how likely you are to still be employed a year from now, your likelihood that you're going to buy a new car in the next year, all variety of things you're scored on. These scores are not only individual scores, they're also neighborhood-based scores. How likely is it that someone who lives in your zip code is going to do X? Um, so I just want to get a little more information about you guys before I uh, talk about education in specific. Um, I presume that most of you all work with data. And so I'm curious, how many of you all use data that you get from schools or from state education or district education agencies? A lot of school data, okay. How many of you all are using data that's collected on the internet by a vendor or you're the vendor yourself? Okay. Um, and how many of you all are purchasing data and using that as well? Okay. Um, so FERPA was passed in 1974, and it makes education records confidential. It gives parents and eligible students a right to um, inspect and to seek to amend the education records if they're wrong. And I'll say it again, it does not mean you get to correct the grades if you don't like the grades. It's truly data that's wrong. Um, we administer FERPA through the Family um, Policy Compliance Office, which is under me. And FERPA is not the only statute that deals with education records. Uh, we also have the Protection of Pupil Rights Amendment, which deals with the commercialization of data, data collected from students. And we also have COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. That's administered by the Federal Trade Commission, and it deals with the collection of data from children under 13, the 12 and under crowd. So now we have, in most states, state longitudinal data systems. I think we have them at 44 or 45 states now. And more importantly, we have wholly new types of education data. We don't just have the data that was previously physical data, which has now been digitized, like student performance data. We now have online data. We have MOOC data, metadata, paradata. And we have the ability to link data from disparate data sets. Those of you who are getting commercial data, I presume, are linking it to um, student performance data, to uh, data that you get from your vendors, et cetera. We have the ability to create fairly accurate longitudinal data files that can see how a student, an individual student, progresses through the system. And we have schools and districts that are increasingly outsourcing, as they must, in order to uh, appreciate the benefits of data in schools. We uh, issued guidance on this subject in February um, about uh, contracting out for online services for schools. And uh, a number of other organizations have also issued toolkits to help school districts with this. The key point is that if a school or district is going to be outsourcing, it needs to have a legitimate educational interest in order to do so, and it needs to maintain direct control over the um, vendor to whom it is contracting. The real challenge for us is that there are 15,000 school districts in this country, and they run the gamut from large metropolitan and suburban school districts that are fairly sophisticated. They have CIOs or CTOs, and they have an infrastructure to help, um, support data use to truly microscopic <coughs> school districts in this country. For us to get the word out to all of these school districts and schools about how to do contracting appropriately, not only how to do it legally, but how to follow best practices is a huge, huge challenge. 
So FERPA, our law, puts the burden on the schools. We look to the schools and the districts to um, follow good practices when contracting out. But I want you to also understand that we feel very strongly that there is a role for the vendor community in this process as well. It does, uh, having um, all of the burden on the schools is not a feasible solution here. The vendor community needs to do the right thing. It needs to have privacy policies that make sense and it, they need, vendors need to be transparent about the data and they're using. So, um, very recently, on uh, May 1st, we had the White House release a report on big data. I don't know how many of you have read that. The report itself is interesting um, because it recommends that we explore modernizing the regulatory framework for FERPA and COPPA. Um, we agree, and we're happy to have that discussion. Senator Markey has in indicated his interest in that, having that discussion as well. What is, I think, potentially more interesting than the White House report on big data that came out is the companion report that was issued by PCAST, P-C-A-S-T, the Presidential Commission, Advisory Commission on Science and Technology. I'm getting the title a little wrong, but if you Google PCAST big data and privacy, you'll find the report. Um, this report was issued on the same day as the um, President's report, the John Podesta report, and it reaches some different conclusions. Um, the presidential report, the Podesta report, really embraces the continued use of fair information practice principles as the basis for dealing with big data and privacy. It recognizes appropriately that there are issues with that, but it still um, embraces the continued use of um, FIPS. In contrast, the report from the technologists, the PCAS report, um, questions whether FIPS, Fair Information Practice Principles, are still a viable solution in the modern world. Um, the, the, the quote that I loved, and I, I hand wrote this, so I may not have gotten the words exactly right, um, deals with the issue that notice and consent are much less meaningful in the modern online world than they were back when the Fair Information Practices were done. And the quote is, in some fantasy world, users read privacy policies, they understand the implications, they consult their attorneys, they look at the terms for the competitive products, they negotiate with the vendor, and only then do they consent. The reality is different. I loved that quote, and I think that's a fair statement of the problem that we all face. Privacy policies are long. Um, the Department of Health and Human Services just issued a model privacy policy for HIPAA. Now, I applaud them for that. I'm, that's something we still need to do. It took them years to do it. Their model privacy policy was six pages long. How do you display that on a mobile device with a three-inch square screen? How do you meaningfully get that across to people? It's a huge challenge. Um, so let me run through a couple current issues uh, real quickly here. Um, smart disclosure and my data buttons. I'm, I'm a little perplexed why this hasn't caught on more in the education field. This is big in the medical arena where people want to keep and maintain the medical records about themselves. The VA has a very successful, I get the colors confused, blue, green, purple, whatever button that allows users to download the information in their VA medical file. We don't really have that happening so much in the education workspace. We have a button available on our um, FSA page for students who have input all their FAFSA information that they can download the majority of it in a machine readable form. Um, database multiplication, another issue to think about here. So again, I believe databases are good things, but there are always, when you have aggregations of data, concerns about governance, security, and use restrictions in particular. Uh, it's not so much the state longitudinal data systems, it is the proliferation of databases. We now have a number of cities that are creating integrated databases. They're doing wonderful things with them. They're putting together the data from their different social service agencies and uh, also their education agencies in order to improve outcomes for children, for people in poverty, for all sorts of things. But there's a proliferation, so the same data will appear in these multiple data sets. There's now databases dealing specifically with early childhood data. And more importantly, it's not just the public entities that have um, data and databases anymore. Many of you all are in the vendor community. Many of you have what we at the Department of Education do not have, which is a national database of student level information. Um, database multiplication. So a real key issue in privacy right now in the education arena and everywhere is re-identification. 
So I think all of you are familiar with the idea that when you publish tabular data that you have to be careful about small cell sizes. But there's virtually an explosion of information available about us, and many are questioning the continued viability of um, systems that are built around the ability to anonymize data. There are so many examples, and I'm sure you guys have heard them. I don't want to go, go through this again. There's the Netflix study where people are able to identify you based on um, the movies that you've rented in Netflix. The Harvard Facebook study. Harvard released a, a data set um, for social science research based on um, Facebook use, and immediately people were able to re-identify students, uh, specific students in there, including gender preference, drinking habits, all sorts of things. In 2011, Paul Ohm, a law professor at the University of Colorado, published a very influential article um, challenging that with the increasing abil ability to re-identify individuals that our privacy framework in this country doesn't make sense. And he's right. Um, Privacy statutes in this country at the federal level are premised on there being a distinction between personally identifiable data and anonymized data. And that uh, distinction increasingly has to be called into question. Um, information that is now anonymized may no longer be anonymized in the future. You think about data that is uh, medical data that's in tissue banks with DNA uh, typing now, that information should no longer be considered um, an anonymous. So another issue to think about as you start thinking about your projects is discrimination and predictive analytics. So how many of you have heard about the target study and the pregnancy tests? I'll, I'll tell it, because a few of you hadn't, and it's just such a fun story, and I'll be quick about it. Um, so Target um, wanted to they send you coupons, and they wanted to be able to identify who's gotten pregnant. And so they used all of the information from their loyalty cards to draw conclusions about who had just gotten pregnant so they could start giving them coupons for pregnancy products. And they used, who knows what they used. It was some combination of um, all of a sudden women stopped buying scented products. They wanted unscented products. You ever been pregnant? You'll understand. Um, they start buying more items for the home. Based on their purchases, they can identify who's pregnant. So they sent off a coupon and a father storms into the store and says, this is my daughter, she's 17, how dare you send her this? And a week later he goes back into the store and says, I'm sorry, evidently there are things going on in my house I didn't know about. <laughs> so the, the idea that Target will know you are pregnant potentially before you are is a, a predictive <laughs> analytics. Um, so predictive analytics is a wonderful thing. Um, some of the student success systems that were mentioned in the previous se session um, that are being used in higher ed particularly are doing great things. You know, they're looking in and they're noticing there is a, a strong um, correlation between um, students who aren't logging in enough to the student information system and their chance of uh, not succeeding. And so they start a reach out to students if they notice that they're not logging in. That's a wonderful use. But other higher ed institutions in this country are using predictive analytics differently. Uh, I don't want to name any names here. Maybe some of you are from the institution I'm thinking of. But they are using predictive analytics to give scores to incoming students and to say, we're not going to let you do certain majors because we think you have a poor chance of success in that particular major. So that troubles me. And it doesn't trouble me because it breaks any law that I administer. It troubles me as a person who has achieved, who, who values the, va the failures that I have had in my life. What right does a university have to take away your right to failure? Um, I shouldn't put it that way. Uh, those of you at universities. <laughs> Seriously, I think failure is very important, and I think the ability to do that is important, and taking away the individual choice is something that I, I question in that. Um, so another issue is open data. Um, there are various executive orders on this. All of us in federal agencies are striving hard to, uh, to keep up with it, to release more data, and to release it in machine-readable format. Um, we're very proud at the Department of Ed because we have a fairly good inventory that we have recently published. Uh, you can, I hate to use this as a, uh, a verb, but you can Google it and find it. Um, it's not complete yet, but there you can look up what we have at the variable level. And I think that's an important type of transparency for federal agencies to have. So as we wrap up, I just want to go over a few things to, as you think about the projects that you're doing, to think about them on the front end. 
Um, so the first is, I agree, there's huge issues with fair information practice principles, but you can't forget about them yet. Think about them as you start um, looking at your new projects. Think particularly about the one dealing with access and correction rights. If your data is being used to make benefit determinations for the students, then you need to be able to allow some right to correct them. Think particularly about governance. If you've got large accumulations of data, you have to think about governance. It's a process, it's a structure, it establishes responsibility for data, for who has access rights to data. It assigns roles and responsibilities. Data governance isn't easy. Um, I speak from experience. Um, all the agencies that I have worked with uh, devote major resources to data governance. So the most important thing I want to pass on to you about data governance is it needs to be written down. And that sounds way too simple, but I want to tell you until you write down and get agreement on who has rights to things, who has which roles and responsibilities, and who's responsible for keeping up with the data, you do not have agreement on those important things. I want to talk to you about a culture of confidentiality and a culture of respect. Organizations have cultures. They have shared patterns of belief and expectations. And your organizations may value innovation. Um, they may value profit. They may value any number of things. But one thing, if you are going to have accumulations of data that you need to value is confidentiality and privacy. You can install this. You can cultivate it in a number of ways. You can have training. You can have awareness. You can have clear policies, written policies, again. Um, but mostly, I think you need executive direction. This is very much a, an area where a leading by example comes into play. And my most important takeaway is transparency. Um, the discussion that I, I had earlier about um, civility in discussions about privacy is where this comes into play. I don't want you to take from that that you should be secretive about what you're doing. I think you should go completely in the other direction. I think you should be posting your research result. I think you should be posting clearly what information you collect, what it's used for, and how you're going to protect it. This is what's going to help when you get these phone calls from some reporter who doesn't know what's going on and is trying to raise allegations about improprieties in your organization. I want you to be proud of what you're doing. So I think data represents progress, and I think the work that you all are doing represents progress. If you've got research results, publish them. Get them out there. Talk about them publicly. Show the value in what you're doing. I think that's really important when we start talking about risk versus reward in the privacy uh, arena here.